So Murray has a story history long before it ever arrived upon the shores of the Chesapeake Bay. Now most brewing was done in the home. A kitchen in the colonial era. Uh, was built specifically for um, brewing beer for the family. Now the duties fell to the wife, along with the majority of other kitchen tasks like cooking, maintaining the park, taking care of the kids, the herb garden. Uh, if one owned a large estate or a plantation, uh, a brew house would have been constructed on the property, and in some cases, a separate fermentation room would have been built as well. For over 100 years, after the founding of Maryland as an English colony, Settlers quick, attempted to quickly concoct their own brews to supplement what was shipped from England. Hops were very difficult to come by, and most malt was imported from England. So home brewers would actually make substitutions, like you see here, using spruce or sometimes birch uh, in place of the hops to still get that bitterness uh, that you would expect. Eventually, colonists would begin to see that the grains grown here in the colony were indeed quite suitable for malting and brewing began in earnest. So why was beer so important to the colonists? Well, it's not a rhetorical question. Um, the one thing that they all had in common when they arrived was a belief that um, water was contaminated and you couldn't drink it. Now in Europe, that happened a lot. There was a lot of contaminated water. It wasn't always safe to drink, but beer, because of the process that it went through, especially the boiling, um, it would be absolutely safe to drink. So, um, beer was what we relied upon when we're out in the fields working all day. We'd have a beer. We'd have a beer with lunch, we'd have a beer with dinner, we'd have a beer for refreshment, or sometimes cider. Now, beer was so vital, the colonists believed it could cure almost everything. So, they believed that hops could cure, or beer could cure scurvy. That's why we wanted to drink it on ships. Well, scurvy is a lack of vitamin C. Hops contain vitamin C. <coughs> Maybe they were onto something. <laughs> And then they thought, well, beer can cure humors. Well, what's humors? Arthritis. Well, guess what? We recently found out that women with rheumatoid arthritis, if they drink uh, a beer or two a day, it mitigates the symptoms. So maybe they actually knew what they were talking about. But they also thought that beer could cure hysteria. And I'm going to leave that one right there. <laughs> but beer was so vital to the colonists they made laws to make sure that all the beer was quality beer. How much malt, how many hops per, per gallon. Um, but also, if you wanted to go to college in America, you could pay your room and board with malt. <laughs> yeah. In fact, almost every college had a brewery on campus because that's what they were serving the kids. Harvard had three. <laughs> Now, in colonial Maryland, every carpenter, when they were building a building, they would get a half a barrel of beer for every single being that was placed. That's a good deal. <laughs> it was um, four different types of beer that you would get, and I'm sure for the carpenters, because every being, that's a lot of beings per building. Um, it was going to be one of the, the, the lower alcohol beers. So what we were dealing with when we think of beer, four different types. Small beer, uh, which is the weakest, it has no cellaring ability. Strong beer, which is the strongest in alcohol content. It can be cellared for extensive periods of time uh, without really compromising the, the quality of the beer. Table beer, which is what we all would usually drink. Um, so this is average alcohol content um, and moderate flavor. And then, of course, ship's beer. So ship's beer, this is brewed with great strength. It's got to withstand long journeys, and apparently it's only fit for sailors because it's just a bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> now the need for commercial brews in Maryland is going to begin really with our expansion of the territory. So as we come up the Chesapeake Bay and we go a little bit more inland, we're going to need uh, more uh, beer available for the people that are coming. The best place to do that, because everybody's home brewing, is to find a tavern. So taverns kind of acted like the catch-all for everybody when we think about the colonies. Um, they would serve as mail stops, courtrooms, social centers, trade centers. All of your craftspeople would set up next to the tavern. So if you needed a blacksmith or um, what have you, they would be set up next to the tavern so you could find everybody. And most of these taverns provided beer for travelers or for new residents who didn't know how to make their own beer. The 
first commercial brewery in Maryland is going to be set up actually in 1703 in Annapolis, and that's going to be Benjamin Fordham. Now, he's going to operate this brewery until his death in 1716. We don't know what he made. Um, we're assuming it's just uh, probably table beer, uh, but we don't have a record of if it was good or not. So 13 years, it had to be drinkable, um, <laughs> we would hope, uh, but um, it was desired at least by some in Annapolis. When we start to get really good beer, it's going to come from Patrick Craig in Annapolis. He's a third generation Irish immigrant. His family was from Kilkenny. And he's going to settle on the Chesapeake Bay in Annapolis. His parents and his grandparents are going to die. They're going to leave him a very small bequest, and he's going to turn it into something pretty amazing. Um, he is going to have a tough time at first, but he's going to start as a painter, and he's going to do what a lot of immigrants did. You're going to start with whatever job you can get and work your way up. So he started as a painter, and then he started working on um, contracting, and then he became the contractor. He is actually responsible for building related Folly. If you don't know what this is, this is the governor's mansion in Annapolis. But one of his greatest interests, in, he was also a shipbuilder, was a brewery. All he really wanted to do was brew beer. So of course he's going to open up a brewery, and um, the brewery is going to be pretty good. He's going to build not only tenement housing for his workers, so they have somewhere to stay while they work in the brewery. He's going to have them malting the barley. Um, he's going to establish consistency with this. Instead of guessing what's coming from England and what will work, you're malting your own. You have greater consistency. You have a better shot at making a beer that is going to taste very similar every time that you make it. He's going to use local hops. And with the business ventures, he's actually going to be able to make quite a fortune. He's going to buy three properties in Annapolis on Prince George Street. This is his home that he built. It's still standing today, so you can actually see it and tour it occasionally. Uh, so again, an immigrant coming into America, working really hard, opening a brewery, being a little bit of a jack of all trades, and really helping to establish the town uh, that they're in. And that's the big thing about the brewers that are coming to America. They are helping to build the towns, not just the beer. <laughs> and we're going to see this over and over again. But commercial brewers are really going to struggle because everybody's brewing at home. The first successful brewery in Baltimore, Mark already mentioned, um, is actually going to be the Barnett's Brewery, John Leonard Barnett's and his son Elias Daniel. So they are immigrants from Balkenstein, Germany, and they established breweries in New York and Hanover, Pennsylvania before they came to Baltimore. Now, when they opened this brewery in Baltimore, it was just 60, you know, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, you'd think of it like a three-horse town. It had three gates, actually, stockade gates, to protect everyone. It was not much to it. Um, there wasn't much that was built. And they really needed beer. They didn't have many people, not all the people that were coming into um, Baltimore, coming into Maryland and the colony, could brew. They were actually advertising for brewers. We need you to come to the colony. We'll pay your way. If you can brew, we'll pay your way. Come on. Um, so it was really good to have someone that knew how to brew. And they were successful, not only because you didn't have enough home brewers, but because it's a family legacy of brewing. So they knew how to make adjustments. But because they were already operating in Pennsylvania, they knew how to adjust to the local ingredients and make it a success. But as Mark said, they also were responsible for um, Zion Church. So we're in the more modern incarnation, of course, but Elias Daniel was um, integral in making sure that Zion Church happened, which is the Brewer's Church. Now, I think Mark's giving a tour after this, maybe? I think so. Not gotcha. sure. Um, you'll see quite a bit from the brewers that he mentioned. Uh, that are you know, strewn throughout, stained glass windows, altar pieces, all sorts of things, um, that they have left their legacy. Again, it's helping to build the community, um, not just the beer. But when we look towards the latter half of the 18th century, tensions are growing between America and England. Uh, why? Well, intolerable taxes and other things that we have going on. So the switch becomes buy American. We need to buy American, not just get everything imported from England. But what we had was a shortage of hops, malts, because we were still working on regular malting here, and we didn't have much in the way of glass. So we start to see a real push towards opening glass factories, making sure we have malts and hops and beer uh, that are going on here to meet the demand. Now, some people are going to do it on their own, 
John Hill Wardley, who's going to establish a brewery in 1770 on Y Island. Now, this is one of the earliest colonists in Maryland to establish a hop farm. He actually was obsessed with hop farming. So all he could think about was, how do I grow hops? How do I make it better? What do I need to do to the soil? And he had on his plantation, um, he was completely self-sufficient. He had a distillery, he had a tannery, he had a brewery. Um, you know, he had operations for taking care of everyone, including the army, if it came to war, and it did. We're also going to see this greater role in equal measure of success for breweries that do malt beer and barley. Um, it's not going to taste the way it does now here. Uh, what we used to do is we used to heat the malt um, and it would, you know, with polar wood to um, get it to the point that it needed to be in germination before we would arrest it. And what would happen is that would give a lot more smoky notes to the malt. So the beers that we're thinking of drinking at this time are not going to be much like what we're drinking now. Um, they're going to be a little bit smokier. They're going to be a little bit different. But you can, when you malt your own, you're going to get that consistent brew, and that's going to be a really important part of this. Now, the rise of commercial breweries in Maryland is going to be, and of course we're going to get helped with things like the thermometer and the hydrometer, but the rise of commercial breweries is really going to come from the war. Um, we need beer, because that's how we got men to sign up to fight. <laughs> we, promised, we promised a daily ration of beer. They would get a quart per day of either spruce beer or cider. In fact, um, George Washington, God bless him, he made sure whenever he could that he set up his encampments next to a tavern or a brewery so that he, his men could get the daily rations. Now, of course, it's got to be spruce beer or cider. The alcohol content's pretty low. Um, they actually passed legislation that no uh, soldiers were allowed to have a daily ration of rum, colonial rum. I think this is a really good idea because I don't want that bayonet behind me if the guys are going to drink too much rum. I'm just going to say. <laughs> Not the best idea. But we're going to see the rise of the breweries and afterwards, because the legislation was so lenient, we're going to see quite a few soldiers establish breweries. Thomas Peters, uh, from Philadelphia. He was a Revolutionary War soldier. He's actually going to open his brewery in Baltimore on the Jones Falls on King George Street in 1784. He wanted nothing more than to make English ales, and he does a fantastic job. He is going to bring on employees. He is going to bring on a malster. He's going to malt his own barley. He's going to introduce partners. He's going to expand. He's going to grow. It's going to thrive. It's going to serve a lot of people in Baltimore until it succumbs to fire in 1812 at a loss of $80,000. Fire is a big problem with breweries. Everything's made out of wood. Everything's made out of wood. You've got open flame everywhere. Um, it's something that can happen easily, and we see it repeatedly um, with the breweries in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Now, as the 19th century passes its first decade, tensions are going to heat up with Britain due to the press gangs. So, after the Revolutionary War and we have our independence, Britain still needs people to serve um, in the Navy, in the Army, and they have compulsory service. So, if you were born in Britain, even though you're now an American citizen, they're going to come take you off of our ships and force you into service. This is one of the things that caused um, the decision to, one of the founding decisions to go to war uh, was the press gangs. So Maryland breweries are going to gear up and for the War of 1812, and they're going to do a great job, and we're going to hold off the Brits until 1814. This is when they're done fighting Napoleon, and they can turn all their energy and efforts towards America. And this is when Washington is going to burn. <laughs> we have um, men that were not quite ready for this. We hadn't done a lot since the Revolutionary War. and. Um, we're going to struggle. Washington's going to burn. And as soon as that happens, the Brits say, we're going for Baltimore. Why Baltimore? What's wrong with Baltimore? What did Baltimore do? Well, that's where the nest of pirates is. The British believe that all of, all of the problems that they've had at sea with their ships getting targeted and their cargo getting stolen, it was all pirates coming out of Baltimore. Not Baltimore. They would not be pirates. <laughs> So they decide to attack um, by land and by sea. By land, um, they're going to come to North Point. By sea, it's Fort Henry. A critical role in this war is actually going to be played by that Thomas Peters brewery, um, the one that burned in 1812. George Brown, who's War of 1812 soldier, he's actually going to buy it 
for $65,000 and renovate it. His neighbor is Mary Pickerskill. Now, Mary Pickerskill made her way by sewing, and she was commissioned to sew flags for Fort of Henry, a garrison flag and a storm flag. The garrison flag was 30 by 42 feet, way too large for her house. So she went next door to George and said, hey, you've got this big open brewery. Can I come in here and sew the stars on the flag because it's big enough that they'll all be even? He said, absolutely, come on. So she brought her daughter and her niece and an indentured servant. It took about six weeks for her to sew all the stars on the flag. Um, once it was done, thank goodness it got done, um, because on September 13th of 1814, Fort McHenry was bombarded. Now, we just passed this anniversary. For 25 hours, the British, hoping to gain access to the northwest and middle branches of the Patapsco River in the city of Baltimore, fired upon Fort McHenry. Major George Armistead was in charge of the fort with 1,000 men. Now, the fort is going to withstand 1,800 rounds of mortar shells and fire from Congaree rockets. Congaree rockets are our first liquid fuel rockets, so for every inch of fuel that you add, it's going to go another 100 feet. But they weren't super accurate, so they were kind of like sidewinders, and they would go off a little bit, but they had greater distance than the cannons. So while the British were firing on Fort McHenry, George Armistead is firing his cannons back, and they're not reaching the ships. So they just have to stay and take it. Now, watching all of this, aboard a troop ship, a British troop ship, was Francis Scott Key. He is a Washington lawyer that was negotiating a prisoner release. After the 25 hours, morning dawns, the smoke starts to clear, and he sees the flag flying high above the fort. And he knew that we survived the onslaught. And he took a pen to paper and he wrote the defense of Fort McHenry. Today we know this as the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem, and our symbol of freedom as of 1931. Unfortunately, George Brown, who owned the brewery, couldn't maintain it. So he sold it to another War of 1812 veteran, Eli Claggett, in 1819. The brewery is going to bloom under Claggett's stewardship, and what we're going to see is Claggett bringing in the first steam power into Baltimore in the brewery. He used a six horsepower engine just to grind the malt. This helped increase capacity to 10,000 barrels per year. This is incredible for the time. Now, Claggett's was only the beginning of steam power taking over many brewery functions. By the mid-19th century, all the breweries, at some level, are going to have some sort of steam uh, power technology. If you don't, it's really hard to compete. Breweries are going to continue to grow in Maryland, and we're going to see the very first brewery in Carroll County in 1821. You might recognize the name. Michael Barnett. He is the great-grandson of John Leonard. Brewing is in the family. Now, he opens um, Carroll County's first brewery was just becoming Carroll County at Frederick in Baltimore, and he was helping to build the city of Westminster. He was appointed as the first judge um, over the first elections that were held after Westminster was incorporated in 1850. He helped found the Westminster Academy, which is a children's school, so the kids could be educated. There wasn't anything that he didn't do to help Westminster. And again, this is what the brewers do. They help build the communities that they live in. Barnett's uh, used the steam technology. Uh, he used engines to grind malt uh, and to separate the hop oil from the wort. He used a hydrometer to measure gravity to see how much alcohol was in there. And he malted his own barley and spelt. If you guys aren't familiar with spelt, it makes for an interesting beer. Um, <laughs> but you know what? He was the only brewery between Baltimore and Frederick and everybody loved his beer. He, was, he really filled the need uh, in Westminster, and the hotels could not get enough of his beer to serve to the patrons. What is spelt? Spelt is another grain, um, so it's in the same family as um, barley, but it's just, it's a little bit different. It's not quite where you go with the flavor of wheat, but it's, it's much more uh, granular, grainy. So it's very interesting. Uh, give it, definitely give it a try. Um, so all of these things allowed Michael Barnett to stay in business for 20 years and establish a precedent for other uh, Carroll County brewers and Westminster brewers to follow suit. Another region where we're going to see um, a lot of breweries start to build is in, in Western Maryland, specifically Allegheny County and Cumberland. 
in part because of the national road that was built, but also because we start building the railroad. And that's bringing grain back and forth. And that allows breweries to really grow because they have more access to it. One of the uh, immigrants that came in and actually established a brewery initially started with the b and Railroad, uh, James McNulty. He was from County Kildare, uh, Ireland. He was a really bright man. He went to university, Maine University in Dublin, uh, before coming to America. He was all set to stay in Dublin and pursue a career until the great hunger hit. It wasn't much for anybody, so he came to America, worked for the BNO until a train jumped the tracks and damaged his leg permanently. So he could no longer work for the BNO. He said, Oh, this is perfect. Now I can open a brewery. That's all I really wanted to do anyway, even though I went to university. So he moved out to um, Mount Savage outside of Cumberland. He had a home with his wife and six kids. He started brewing and selling the beer out of his home. And he actually, to Mark's point, you don't always have a place to store your beer. He got creative. He actually dug into the hillside next to his home to make vaults. He just carved out a little place and he'd store the beer there. He also brought a little taste of home to his beer. He used Kildare moss in his beers. It gave a, a, a nice flavor to it, but also it was used to clarify the beer. So instead of having the cloudy beers, it, it clarified. It was really good. Um, so it was a very unique product for the time. This venture was successful enough for him to take care of his family and six kids without ever blinking because his beer was so good. But it's Baltimore, really, that leads the way with the number of breweries. Conditions were ripe in our major port for breweries to thrive. From 1820 to 1872, Baltimore received more than 195,000 immigrants from the port of Bremen, Germany. Many of these immigrants established breweries in Baltimore. Um, they embraced the new technologies. But accompanying these brewers was a lager yeast, previously unavailable in America. Why? Because of the length of time that it took to cross the Atlantic. Now, the invention of the clipper ships, the ones that were supposedly haranguing the British during the War of 1812, they got faster, um, they got a little bit bigger, and they could carry passengers and cargo from Bremen to Baltimore in less than 30 days. Lager yeast can't survive more than 30 days. So now we can have lager yeast in the colonies, and this is when we're going to see the, the rise of sustained industrial brewing and lager brewing here in Maryland and throughout America. The difference between ale and lager. Ale, the, the yeast is actually going to ferment at higher temperatures. But for lager, it's got to ferment. It's special yeast, but it's got to ferment at lower temperatures, much cooler temperatures, for about four weeks where ale's ready in about eight days. So this was... Um, not just the start of lager brewing, but this is also when we start to see the excavation of lagering cellars throughout Baltimore. Baltimore is filled with subterranean, subterranean lagering cellars, especially Highland Town, Canton, Federal Hill, as Mark had mentioned. Um, this is perfect because it's much cooler and you can and give your lager time to, to ferment. So we're going to see the rise of breweries and brewers like John Frederick Wiesner in 1863. He's from Bavaria. He is actually going to establish a brewery on uh, Bel Air, which is now North Bay Street, if you're familiar with the change in the street names. This was direct competition for the 21 other breweries in Baltimore. It was an advanced brewery for the time because he embraced not only the new technology, but the, the tried and true technology, the manual technology that still works. So he was a little bit of everything. He used steam power to cook the mash instead of direct heat under a copper kettle. He had an ice house, a lagering cellar, stables, a cooperage, keg racking area, malting operations, and a storage building. And he housed his 24 employees in his family home with his family and produced some of the best beer in Baltimore in the region. His beer was so good that it fetched $2 more per barrel than any of his competition. Can you imagine buying a quality barrel of beer for six dollars and fifty cents? <laughs> he even erected a statue of Gambrinus. Yep, Gambrinus, mythical god of beer, over the door to his brewery, reminding everyone 
that the God of beer thought Reesner's was the best. He said you should buy it. Now, he was also a strong supporter of Zion Church, um, and he was a philanthropist. He supported the community around him. But brewing was his gift. And by 1910, his brewery, run by his family, was producing 110,000 barrels per year. This is pre-prohibition. This is incredible. He stayed in business, never sacrificing quality for quantity. So even though he's making that much, he's not cutting corners. He's making sure he's still making really good beer. He's going to stay in business till 1920 when prohibition shuts him down. Another one, I think, at least one of you might recognize, uh, the Von der Horst Brewery. Now, um, John Von der Horst was from Hanover, Germany. He was another immigrant that chanced success in America. He opened his brewery in 1866, also on Bel Air Road, not too far from the Wiesner Brewery. Uh, he produced not very much in the first year, about 2,800 barrels in the very first year, but he decided, I'm going to expand and I'm going to build this thing into an amazing, incredible brewery. He installed refrigeration machines, which really is going to help the process. It increases his capacity to 60,000 barrels a year, so he's really taking off. He malted his own barley, but he was also part owner of the Orioles baseball team. Now, his son, Harry, uh, was responsible for turning the Orioles into a National League championship team three years in a row. So if you don't know that the Orioles were in the National League... Yeah, um, what year did the refrigeration machines get implemented? So by, by the 1880s, we're starting to see them. So his son, Harry, was responsible for the championships in the National League with the Orioles. It's a pretty interesting story. It's covered well um, in the book, so you'll get a lot more detail. But the end of the Orioles in the National League came because Harry had uh, some business conflicts in New York, and they were kicked out of the league. But many of the breweries, when you think about them, were family run. Um, Bowerschmidt brothers. Uh, three Bowerschmidt brothers immigrated from Bavaria to establish separate breweries here in Baltimore. Um, in Germany, they were, as I've been told, the, the hillbillies of Nuremberg. Uh, they didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> Life was tough. It's it quite a struggle. Um, and I believe they slept in the basement with farm animals to stay warm at night. Uh, so why not go to America and see what you can do? And they did. And all of them were successful. George Bauerschmidt, perhaps the most successful, I would say. Um, he opened his brewery just a few blocks south of Wiesner and Vanderhorst. And he also happened to marry John, Frederick Wiesner's sister. He, too, was a parishioner here at Zion Church. And in 1887, he possessed the largest brewery in Baltimore. And he was also the first to bottle his own beer on premises, instead of having the beer removed and bottled. To safeguard his family, one of the things that he did, because once you're poor, you're always worried about being poor again. So this was smart. As soon as he had enough money, he turned that money into gold coins. He buried the gold coins in the front steps of his home. If you know North Bay, it intersects North Avenue. Currently, his home is the Great Blacks and Wax Museum. If anybody knows where that is. Okay. That was the Bowerschmidt home. Those front steps had $14,000 in gold coins buried in them. Now, here's the interesting part of the story. All the kids knew about it. Everybody saw it. When George Bowerschmidt passes on, they excavate the steps. There's only $4,000 of gold coins left. What happened to the other $10,000? We don't know. But the kids went to court to find out. Mom never took the stand and testified. <laughs> so, George Bowerschmidt was also um, the first, he was the first to install a von Lind refrigeration machine, as you can see here, um, in his brewery in Baltimore. This is where he said he had never made money, really, as a brewer until he installed the ice machines. Back to the refrigeration machine uh, question. Uh, because once they became available, it just made the process so much more efficient and less labor intensive. Uh, and you could turn out beer a little more quickly. So this was a really good thing. Um, like all the other brewers, he housed the workers within his own home. Um, he was also one of the first stock breweries in Baltimore. Um, everybody benefited. His family, the community benefited from the success of this brewery, particularly when he sells it in 1899 to the Maryland Brewing Conglomerate. 
for a little over two million between cash and stock. One of the most successful breweries that we saw in Maryland prior to Prohibition. Another German immigrant, August Beck, um, he came from a family of German brewers as well. In 1854, he came to America because his brother Thomas had established his own brewery, and August wanted to come work at the brewery. He worked at the brewery, and then he decided, like many brewers, I'm going to open my own. So he opened a brewery on Garrison and Frederick in 1865. Now, this is the western portion of Baltimore City. We needed more breweries over there, so this was a great idea. He knew people would spend the day at the brewery. So he decided to make sure that they wanted to spend the day at the brewery with their family. Um, concert hall, beer garden on the grounds. Many of the brewers pre-prohibition actually had bowling alleys in addition to the concert halls. Um, they wanted to make sure, load up the wagon, bring the family, we'll stay all day and we'll drink beer. This is great. So uh, this is definitely something August Beck understood. He also saw a large measure of success. He embraced the latest technology and he built um, one of the few Beaux Arts mansions in Baltimore or in Maryland at the time. It was odd to go to the brewery and see this mansion um, that he had constructed, but he really spent a lot of time investing in living every moment of the American dream. He donated to charities, he uh, gave food for the poor, uh, blankets for the people that were cold in winter that didn't have enough heat. He did all kinds of things to make sure he gave back to his community. And in 1879, he is going to turn over brewing operations to his two sons. Unfortunately, there's going to be a few problems. His wife had died a few years before, and he remarried to a much younger Trollope, I mean, woman. <laughs> <laughs> Frederick Beck. Um, so he made her sign a prenuptial agreement. Good idea, great plan. Um, and what that said was that once he died, she would be given $4,000 in cash, and she could live in the mansion until she remarried. Within about a month, not quite two, she remarried and moved out of the mansion after his death. So the sons, going through the process of probate, find out a couple of things. Number one, dad was deeply indebted to the monsters because he didn't malt his own barter. So now they had to figure out, we've got this huge debt, we're going through probate, and is it going to get turned over to the creditors? And in the middle of all this, Frederica shows up with a lawsuit against the brothers for partnership in the brewery. Well, if that doesn't mesh with the prenuptial agreement, well, guess what? She's saying that she has a baby. That is the brother of these two young men and the son of August Beck Sr. Wow. Really? She was full term when he died, and they lived in the house with her, and they never noticed that she was pregnant? <laughs> well, she whiz. Um, that was a nice thing that she did. Uh, so they started to challenge what she was saying. And the judge, of course, held everything up and said, wait a minute, we've got to decide how to d divide the brewery assets. And the brothers started to bring forth witnesses that testified that there's no way that that child was the son of August Beck. Well, before DNA, I'm not really sure how you do that. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there were witnesses, but it became very interesting. And eventually, when they wanted to bring her on the stand to testify, she disappeared. She took the son, who she had named after the brothers, just to make sure that he would be ingratiated to them, and she fled to Germany. It now became an international incident. The judge, the probate judge, would not solve this until they got testimony and investigation as to whether that child was indeed August Beck Sr.'s son or not. <laughs> so our president at the time, Rutherford B. Hayes, actually had to contact Wilhelm, the first of Germany, and ask him to investigate Frederica and determine if in fact her child was August Beck Sr.'s son. Wow. Over the brewery. Well, Brewery was lost to the brothers, but eventually, after the death of, of the younger brother, August Beck Jr. will reclaim the family brewery. He's going to update it, he's going to run it, he's going to honor his father's tradition after all of the trials and tribulations that he went through, and then he's going to lose it in 1899. He's forced to sell the brewery because he too is indebted to the monsters. The problem here is the monsters have all the power. If you do not mulch your own, 
have to buy your mulch or you can't have a brewery. Well, if you have something go wrong, a bad batch of beer, you've got to get more malt to make more beer. Well, how do you do that if you don't have any money because you can sell your beer because the beer is bad? Then you leverage your equipment and your brewery. So maltsters were seizing breweries left and right because of this. And this is something that breweries had to learn the hard way, but they did. The Glow Brewery. Originally, it was just going to be a malt house. They thought, wow, there's a need for more malts, malsters in Baltimore because there were really only a few. But then they realized, you know what, we're embracing all the latest technologies. We know how to brew. Um, and this is, uh, you know, a common sensical kind of thing. Why don't we just brew and have malt? So what they did was they foresaw the need for all of it. And not only did they make really good beer, they made about um, 120,000 barrels a year. They malted about 200,000 bushels a year of malt. They had refrigeration, they had malt grinders, all the latest technology, but they were the very first brewery to actually sign on for centralized power. All the breweries operated with a generator on premises. Lowe decided, we're going to sign up for central power, so it's going to come from a separate station and it's going to run to our brewery. We can operate if we want to, 24 hours a day. They saw this as the future of brewing, how to compete with everybody else, and it made them one of the most successful brewers and breweries in the state. And that's the defining feature, really, of the turn of the century. You've got William Painter, who invents the crown cork closure. I think you all might recognize this, right? Your standard bottle caps that you see today. William Painter's responsible. It's the foundation of the crown cork and seal company. Um, we still use these. The difference is we don't have cork. We have um, an enamel that we use now. It's funny, William Painter said this was the easiest thing he ever invented, this closure to keep all the contaminants out and the oxygen out of the beer bottles. But the hardest thing was to invent the machine to actually put it on the top of the bottle without breaking it. But he wasn't the only one. Um, you might recognize Consolidated Gas, Electric, Light, and Power Company uh, originally started out as Baltimore Gaslight Company. Now, today, we call it pg &E. This is the company that was supplying centralized power to the breweries and to the Crown Court and Seal Company. So we're seeing some pretty amazing advancements. The other thing that we're seeing is the brewery monopolies rising and buying up um, the, the successful breweries to try to control the beer market in different regions. George Bowerschmidt sold to the Maryland Brewing Company. Um, this became kind of the dividing line for breweries. Are you with the conglomerate or are you independent? Fred Bowerschmidt, George's son, um, he and his brother actually opened a brewery specifically because they were so mad at their father for selling to the conglomerate. They wanted to go open their own brewery, be independent, and put the conglomerate out of business. And this is the brewery. Um, Fred ended up running it alone, um, buying out his brother. But uh, this is the independent American brewery. This battle is still waging today, but at this point, it didn't matter because in 1920, all the breweries are going to fall to Prohibition. Prohibition. They thought that if everybody went dry, that everything would be fixed. No more poverty, no more domestic violence, uh, no more illiteracy. Guys would get off the bar stools and go back to work. All of the things, all of the ills of society could be cured if we just got rid of alcohol. Well, that really didn't work so well. <laughs> and what would happen to the breweries? Most would close. Some would make what we call near beer. Does everybody know what Odules is? Okay. So what they would do is they'd make real beer and then they'd boil it until all the alcohol was gone. And that was near beer, so you could serve that. Well, along with the boiling out of the alcohol, I think most of the flavor went too. <laughs> Some of the breweries actually uh, went to ice manufacturing or making malt syrup. So if you couldn't have your beer, you could still have that malt flavor in your sodas or your pancakes. Some breweries were actually legally permitted to produce real beer if you had a prescription. Oh, my elbow. Oh, <laughs> doc, doc, my elbow. Could, could, could I have some beer? Absolutely. $2 for the doctor, $2 for the prescription, and you're set with some beer for a while. That's really expensive at the time. Not everybody can afford the $4 for the beer, but that's okay because Maryland is a wet state. Um, we had Governor Ritchie, God bless him. Uh, he 
didn't believe in prohibition. He thought it was a bad idea. He never funded state-level prohibition agents. So everything that had to be done had to be done at the federal level. So, if you wanted to drink beer or wine or spirits during prohibition, that's fine. Governor Ritchie said, as long as you pay your excise taxes, I'll warn you when a raid is coming. So this didn't happen. Well, how do you pay your excise taxes on something that's illegal? Route 1 was just north to south American, was lined with cigar shops. Literally, you'd walk in, there'd be glass cases of ten of cigars. You'd walk in, you'd look at the manager and say, hey, Joe sent me. And the manager would look at you, wink, and take you to a door in the back. You'd walk through, and there's as much beer, wine, and distilled spirits as you can imagine. Speakies is hidden behind all of these cigar shops. That's how you pay your excise taxes. Just pretend it's cigars. Now, this is a really good thing, but some people, still not going to the speakeasies, um, and some people had stockpiled booze, and it ran out eventually. It's 13 years of prohibition. So they tried to make it themselves at home. Sometimes it worked out really well with the beer, sometimes not. At least if you're making beer and it fails, the worst that's going to happen from drinking it is a stomach ache, some gastrointestinal upset, right? But when you're making the distilled spirits, if you've never distilled before, blindness, death, liver failure, all kinds of horrible things can happen to you. So prohibition is actually going to come to an end. One of the reasons is because alcohol is still produced, distributed, and consumed. We're drinking alcohol in higher um, ABV, right? There's, there's more, um, stronger alcohol than what we were drinking before prohibition. We're drinking more of it and it's much stronger. That's not good. Um, but also, think of all the alcohol that's still being made. I mean, it, it allowed for the bootleggers to just gouge everyone. There's a lot of money to be had. They were bribing um, prohibition agents to make sure they could make their deliveries. $300 million annually was lost to state, local, and federal agencies in tax collection and revenues during Prohibition because they were still making and selling beer. So imagine the Great Depression is going on, which it was. All of this money could be going back into the states and the Fed. People, people could have jobs. They could feed their families. And that was one of the big things about Prohibition is they didn't think of how many affiliated industries were going to be affected. It wasn't just brewers and wineries and distilleries. It was the pork makers. It was the carpenters. It was the sign painters, the coopers, um, you know, the, the, those that delivered with their horses, the stables. They delivered beer. Um, so, so many industries were affected and people couldn't find other jobs. But finally, the taps are going to flow once again, and Globe is going to produce the Globe from 1881. It's going to produce the first real beer after legalization on April 7, 1933. And if you recognize him, H.L. Lincoln was actually drinking an Arrow beer at the Renner Hotel just a few minutes after midnight. Gunther, which you may recognize, um, they were established in 1880. They were the second brewery to produce real beer after Prohibition. Again, it's different owners. So it was the Gunther family up to Prohibition and for, for most of Prohibition. And just a couple of years before Prohibition um, ended, uh, they had to sell the brewery. National Brewing Company, I think a lot of you recognize this one. Uh, yeah, so uh, again, started in 1885, different owners by the time we reach uh, repeal. They're going to have National Bohemian and National Premium by 1934. Uh, Mr. Bow and Mr. Pilsner became familiar faces in the land of pleasant living. American, I think many of you also recognize, this was the John Frederick Reesner Brewery. Uh, they were producing malt syrup during uh, Prohibition and they quickly converted. Um, now here's the thing, just to come up to what they needed to compete with the other breweries, just to become a brewery again, $600,000 in renovations. That's just American. When you think of breweries after repeal, the average is between $500,000 and a million dollars just to get up to what you need to be able to do to compete. The electrical, this is all coming from the central power station. Remember, only low at first before prohibition for the breweries. That was the first one, and not many followed suit before prohibition. So instead of having a brewery almost seemingly on every corner, now we're only going to have a handful of breweries because it's prohibitively expensive. 
as World War II is about to kick off. We also see for the first time the canning of beer. American Can Company is going to invent an enamel-lined can uh, and an interlocking lid so that the beer does not interact with the metal, which was the problem before Prohibition. It was an awful bacterial, horrible mess before Prohibition. Uh, but finally, they're going to figure it out. The test case is going to be Kruger's out of New Jersey. The beer is going to be wonderful. Everybody's going to love it. And now you can add another just about $80,000 onto the tab for a new brewery to have a canning line in the brewery. So this is really expensive. But the beer is going to be better. It's going to be held in the can. No oxygen, no contaminants. And this is how we're going to ship beer to our soldiers and sailors overseas during World War II. But even with this great can, it's still going to lose flavor, it's still going to lose carbonation. And on top of that, we've had to change the way that we make beer. Once we entered World War II, we went into grain rationing. So instead of using 100% barley, we're using corn and rice and other adjuncts. It's going to change the flavor. So they're getting beer that is a little bit flatter, it's not as flavorful, and this is the taste that they come back with. So we've got a lot of things that change what people are demanding um, when they get back War. And we're going to see the decline in brewing. Gunther was making a great dry lager that everybody loved. Realizes they can't compete with the likes of Budweiser, who is this mega monopoly, and Schaefer, and Schlitz. And they decide to sell to uh, Theo Pans out of the Midwest. Smart decision. They made a lot of money in 1959 when they sold. But nobody in Baltimore likes Theo Pans. They want their Gunthers back. Um, and Honestly, they thought that the, the Ham's beer was green, and at the time, green beer meant it made you sick. <laughs> it was colored green, or? No, it's just green beer, meaning as soon as you drank it, you were green from being ill. It was that bad. Um, in part, it was because they were shipping it from the Midwest instead of brewing it in Baltimore because they were renovating the, the brewery itself. Queen City had combined, this is out of Cumberland, they had combined with Cumberland Brewing Company to you know, kind of compete in this market that's getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Um, Queen City couldn't. And one of the things that happened when you think of Budweiser, you also have to think of the advent of TV. Suddenly, you have TV, and Budweiser could afford to advertise on TV. None of these regional breweries, except for National, and they ended up having plants out in the Midwest as well, could afford to advertise on TV. And then you walk in the liquor store where, you know, Queen City and Cumberland displays were the biggest display, and all of a sudden you've got a giant Budweiser display, and Queen City and Cumberland are off to the side, and they can't compete, and the beer is half the price for Budweiser because the consumers don't realize it's not in 16 ounce cans, it's in 12 ounce cans. They've kind of, they've played a little game here. Um, the last few years, Queen City and Cumberland were in business. They weren't making any money. They were operating at a loss for years. The only reason they stayed open was because they were the major employer in Cumberland, and all of these families relied upon them, and they would not have other jobs if they closed. So it was one of those moments where you look at the brewery, and they're doing damage to themselves to take care of the community around them. By the 1970s, Globe and American had already closed. National had merged with Carly to cut costs, and eventually merged with G. Heilman, and moved out of Baltimore. But things were going to change. In 1978, Jimmy Carter signed H.R. 1337 into law, legalizing home brewing for the first time since Prohibition. All right. Now, as more people start to home brew, uh, the flavor demand is going to change. It was really expensive to have imports. So now you can kind of brew your own, you can get your own flavor profile, and they want to see more beers with more flavor, not just the standard Budweiser, lager, pours, you know, etc. And one man in the city of Baltimore was ready to answer that call. Hugh Sisson, you may recognize him. His, his family owned a pub in Federal Hill, and he worked with Senator George Della to change the laws in Maryland to once again allow pubs to brew their own beer for sale and consumption. That hasn't been legal since Prohibition. So in 1989, Sissons became the very first brew pub in Maryland, uh, the little uh, place, and it's not, not there any longer, um, but on Cross Street, Federal Hill. And a lot of other brew pubs followed suit. DeGrones, Brewers Art, Briscoe's Tap House, Elegant Mills, and that's just a few. DeGrones is a real English beer, too, that came in. Oh, oh German base. Okay. All of this 
And what we see now is the rise of brewing once again. We're kind of in this renaissance. Jailbreak, who supplied some of the beer this evening. Um, you've got Heavy Seas, I think you all recognize. Union is in the city of Baltimore. Um, they actually had the first female brewer since Prohibition. Checker Spot just opened next to the stadium. Uh, another female owner. And Mully's. Uh, the owner of Mully's became the first female president of the Brewers Association of Maryland. And that was this year. So not only are they brewing, but we're, we're kind of giving it a little bit back to the women that started this. If you remember, we were all brewing in our homes. Uh, so we're starting to see a little trend go back there. And of course, if you didn't know, Guinness just opened uh, in Baltimore County, um, right next to the airport. And uh, we're starting to see an embracing of not necessarily the conglomerate breweries, but Guinness has made sure that they have stationed themselves in a way that they're working with the independent breweries across Maryland so that they don't lose out to the bigger breweries like uh, Budweiser. They're doing a lot of collaborations, they're using local ingredients, and that's the big thing about a lot of the breweries now. They're sticking to local. They are the biggest economic drivers. They're hiring locally. Um, they are making sure that they're investing in the infrastructure. They're spending locally. But the other thing that they're doing is they're trying to get back to making sure that they are using local ingredients. Buy local grains, buy local hops and malts. That's been hard because before Prohibition, Maryland was 80% farmland. Now, that's not the case anymore. And finding malting grains that are suitable, you know, grains that are grown and suitable and malted has been a challenge. But what we're starting to see is the farmers are turning the tide. Black Locust, um, they are in northern Baltimore County. Uh, they have a massive hop farm now. It started out as two little hop plants in an apartment window. It's now a huge farm and supplying breweries across the state. And we've got many more hop farms that are following suit. Um, Amber Fields was in Fred in, it's in Frederick. Um, who you see there is, um, with the owner of Amber Fields is Tom Flores. If you don't know Tom Flores is, he is the head brewer for Brewers Alley and Monocacy. Now he teamed up uh, with Greg Claybaugh, who's the farmer, to plant rye suitable for malting and they started malting. So they made the very first malted um, locally beer made in Maryland from locally um, malted grains from Maryland. And now we're starting to see that catch on um, dark cloud is uh, malting out of Howard County. They've been supplying brewers uh, in Baltimore and the Eastern Shore and all the way out in Montgomery County with local malts. It's very good. Um, Brian Rushmuller was working with a farmer, um, Brooks Clayville, to also work on malting grains on the Eastern Shore. And we've seen two more malt houses rise, um, Chesapeake and Proximity. So we're starting to see this availability. But here's the important part of all of this. It's not just the great beer. Um, Farmers were hesitant about what they could plant because they were always worried about the runoff because the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries are the largest estuary in the United States. And farming, some of the nutrients run off in the bay and harm the fragile ecosystem. But the beauty of planting malting grains is this. Grains suitable for malting hold nitrogen and uh, phosphorus in the pulp of the plant, prevent it from running off or leaching into the soil, it doesn't harm the bay, it saves the bay. So, farmers are starting to gear up and plant more. Um, this is a win. We drink more beer, we're saving the Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> Just saying, drink your beer. <laughs> so, cheers to the farmers of Maryland for providing the necessary components so the brewers may plant the brewers and make the really product that helps us quench our thirsty palates. And cheers to the brewers of Maryland past and present. They have honored us with their craft, and we should honor them. May their stories always be told, and their legacies live on. Thank you. Fantastic job, Maureen. This is just uh, going from colonial times up to present in about an hour or less. Hopefully a little less. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions? We're here to answer any questions about Maryland and Baltimore Marine History, Zion Church. Um, James? 
regarding contemporary history, what is, I know Peter Francho has changed some of the laws in recent years to encourage the brewing industry. Can you elaborate on what he's done? Yeah, so um, actually, unfortunately, the legislation. You can't hear the question. Oh, the question was, what has Peter Francho done to change the laws um, for brewers in Maryland? Unfortunately, the legislation that he tried to push through this past um, session didn't make it through. What he's trying to do, we still have kind of a prohibition era mentality when it comes to brewers. So they are stuck um, being told how much they're allowed to produce and they're told how much they're allowed to sell. Uh, and they are, once they sign up with a distributor, the people that carry the beer from the brewery to the retail stores or restaurants, um, they are with that distributor for life. They can't get out of the contract. It's called a fran it's called franchise law. That's not fair. What if they were a brand new brewery, didn't know any better, signed up with a distributor, and then the distributor doesn't distribute their product? They can't get away from them, which means they go out of business, and breweries have because of it. So what he's been trying to do is to overturn all of that, remove the restrictions, remove the limits. Remove the limits, there we go. Um, franchise law was put in place because of Budweiser. Franchise law was put in place because distributors often only had one or two clients, Budweiser or Schaefer, and if they left, the distributor would go out of business. But that's not the case anymore because we have so many craft breweries, um, and that's why we start to see the rise of some of these distributors like Legends, uh, who's fantastic, um, and they make it easy to get in and out of contracts, and they only cater to craft breweries.